Um, Nathan, this is really an opportunity for you and Noel to converse about your work and, um, you know, what's going on right now. So you might want to go ahead, Nathan, and just kind of share, you know, what's happening in your life and, and, um, and how it's impacting your work. Well, um, you know, it's impacting it twofold. And, and one way is actually good and one way uh, not, so, not so great. But as far as the, um, the negative impact on my work, um, outlets are limited right now. And, you know, I, I have to navigate, you know, or revisit my, my internet structure. You know, before I, I, I'd sold on the internet, but then I switched to a format where I was having clients come over to, uh, to my, my, my studio. And since all this happened, that's not, that's not an option anymore. And I'm happy to re get reacquainted with the internet. But the good news is, is I'm focused on, um, on creating because there, there's nothing else going on. You know, there's not the, the day job. There's not the, um, there's nothing to do except create. And that's what I've, I've always wanted a situation for is to, you know, is to, to push my work and get better as an artist. Nathan, I just, you, you mentioned there before that, um, this period has given you an opportunity to create, focus on the creation, as opposed to the interaction with other people. And um, I'm just wondering, is it possible to see some of your work? You know, are you in a position to show some of your work at the minute for your studio? I'm gonna, I'll take you on a tour, let you see some of the, the sculptures. Some of them yeah. I have hanging and mounted like I would if clients were coming over and, and I have one on, the, on my bed that I'm working on. And yes. I'll start in here. And behind me is one of my hanging sculptures. Yes. And a lot of the, the, the ones in this series, very nature inspired. And I try to get as close to, um, I've got a fascination with things that, that have history to them and like wood, like the older it gets, um, the way it withers, the way it, it just kind of, kind of shows its history that it's been there, it's seen things. And that's, uh, that's kind of why I gravitated to creating sculptures that look like they're constructed out of wood. Yes. And these are, these are actually, uh, they're made of uh, all kinds of papers, napkins. Um, I'd go to restaurants <laughs> And I um, order some napkins to go. And yes. recently, people started bringing me, you know, tons of uh, materials to work with. And recently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my uh, co-workers, she brought um, some onion skins because I mentioned that I wanted to start working in some organic, uh, organic materials as far as the skins. Yes. And, and here is a larger piece that I've been working on. And it's, it's actually a follow up to one of the pieces that I sold at the, uh, that, that Susan sold at the, uh, at the gallery. You see if I can yeah. get a good, a good um, angle on it. Uh -huh. Yes. There you are. Can you, can you say something, Nathan, so we can see it larger? Okay. Um, I don't know how much of it you can see because I'm not in the picture anymore. Can you see it okay? Yeah, we, we can see it, yeah. Nathan, is it made, is, uh, is it like a paper pulp you're working with, like papier mache or is it like a resin, or is it a mixture of glue and uh, recycled paper? It's a mixture of, um, um, you've got the recycled paper, you've got um, aluminum wire, uh, you've got a, a stain that I make, an acrylic stain. I mix it with the uh, with the Mod Podge, and I mix it with I mix it with uh, and I don't know what it's called because a friend of mine gets it from Greece. It's a crystal like stain, and it looks like coffee yeah. grounds. Yes. And I, uh -huh. and I may pull it out of my uh, my bag of tricks and let you all yeah. see it. And I'm going to let you see some of the things that I'm. Uh, that I'm working on, like works in progress. This one right here, she is going to be a, a hanging piece. I wanted to put her on a pedestal. 
Uh-huh. And this is my first, um, it's my first piece that's got a overtly figurative elements to it. Yes. Kind of inspired by mythology. When I'm finished with her, she's still going to have the wood-like elements, but I'm a big fan of Greek mythology, so. She looks like a Medusa type character. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And is it but, quite light? Is it quite light to lift, Nathan? Oh, because you're they're using all light. Paper. They're all light. Yeah. Uh-huh. They're all light. And, and the good thing about it is, is I can make these large forms that, that give the impression that they're extraordinarily heavy. Yes. But yes. They're, they're easy to hang. They're easy to suspend. And, uh-huh. um, and they're pretty durable, too. You know, I'm, I try to make sure that the work is, it, it can look delicate, but I like it to be durable. That was one of the challenges I faced when, when I first started making these. Yeah. They, they were not very durable. I'm always worried about them cracking. But now they got... Do you, do you use a varnish or shellac over it to oh, yeah. um, protect it? Oh, yeah. Um, I use, um, my base is uh, um, Mod Podge, and then I finish with the gel medium, uh, and then I paint over that again to get rid of the, uh, the shininess of it. So, and what's Mod, what's Mod Podge? Is that like um, what we would know as um, Papi Mache? It's, well, it's, it's like a, it's, it's decoupage. It's like a, a glue that dries clear. Yes. And you brush it on top. So it's, it's my first coat of a sealant. So when I put the, um, the layers of paper on and I tear them in strips, I have to put them on one, one strip at a time. Yes. And then yes. I put the, the sealant on it and it hardens. It, it, it turns extraordinarily hard. And then I put uh-huh. another layer on. So I may put three or four layers on and, um, and it, it, it makes for a very durable but still flexible because it has a plastic in it, you know, to yes. make that flexibility. But it doesn't look flexible. And that's what I'm, uh-huh. what I'm wanting to work. Yeah. And, and do you incorporate, when you said there about the organic aspect, mm-hmm. did you incorporate, um, you've deliberately incorporated as, a, as part of the structure, like branches? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so that's, are, they, uh, are they found? Are they found branches that you've deliberately kind of saw something in? Or are they branches that you create? They're branches I create. Um, they're, um, I used to use, and I've gone back and forth between using real wood, and I'll show you some ones that incorporate real wood. Yeah. But as far as the, and, and they, the, the, uh, the wood that I incorporate now is more of a platform, like, they, like, a, like a, a stand or something that they're interacting with before. They yes. were part of the sculpture. The branches were part of the sculpture. But yes. I wanted them to be a, a bit more durable, and as wood ages, it becomes more and more brittle. So I, I had to to mimic wood and keep the natural look of it, but you know, kind of find something that was more uh, more uh, durable. And that's why I started using the aluminum wire. And you see the piece behind you? Uh-huh. You want to talk a little bit about it? That one is um, this is the matador, and the matador is a work that's. Um, actually a piece in progress i'll get close to it so you can see the um the kind of taped armature and the body Mm -hmm. and this one is it's supposed to be a a one of two the arm the um uh, matador and and his mistress and i'm going to incorporate fabric elements too Uh, i don't know if i'm going to use cheesecloth or toile or tool fabric but it's, it's going to, if I do it right, it should look like there is a cape over its arm and it should be blowing. I'm going to use fabric stiffeners. So it's going to give this impression that it's blowing and he's going to have an, an opposite. And it's um, kind of a meditation on, believe it or not, um, this character becoming obsolete to his lover. So he's been this matador, this um, this thing that that has been revealed. You know, you just, just people love him. They they love what what he is. And now it's yes. it's not it's a fading type thing. He's he's beginning to fade, and yes. um, no longer relevant the way that that he was. And yeah. this character is essentially becoming a ghost and coming to terms with that. But he still yeah. portrays that that glorious you know sort of um, um, you know imposing strong figure but when i'm finished with it you'll see you'll be able to see how this this figure is you know becoming obscured by time yes yeah it'll take it'll take a while do you intend do you intend to create the the blowing effect by um when you're talking about fabric uh the the stiffener or the 
um, we would have like we would have in the past the idea of dipping um, fabric or or, or uh, into like a, a a paste or a like a, 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 a film of clay that then could be blown you know and just think with a hair dry that you create that idea of it moving or blowing or draping whatever way you know is that is that the way you think it's going to work or well there's a new problem? spray that I I found this um, spray which to be honest, Noel, it's going to be an experiment. You know, I'll probably strike yeah. out two or three times. Yeah. Um, but the spray, because of the nature of the fabric, I, I don't want any of the weightlessness taken away from it. So yes. I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that I want to dip it um, because it's, it's got to remain airy. And it's my understanding that this, um, this spray is permanent. Yes. So I, I can, maybe I can, you know, work with it after I get some, some degree of permanency with it. Mm -hmm. And we'll just, um, we'll have to see. But that, you know, it's part of the fun part is experimenting and figuring out Absolutely. what different, yeah. Do you, know, so. do you know, Nathan, the very first one that you showed me that was suspended and there was a mm -hmm. lovely shadow in the background and it struck me, this is probably, maybe you've already thought of this, that when they are being exhibited, that depending on the source of light, that mm -hmm. the scale of the piece that you have created can be life size or bigger or smaller. And it strikes me that they're, you know, when you said they're about the matador and the ghost-like quality, it's like um, the shadows and the interaction is is very powerful. One of the shows, a couple of the shows that I had featuring these, uh, one of the big highlights and that people enjoyed were the shadows that were cast by the um, by the sculptures. So, yes. and that was that was inadvertent. I, I I had no idea, but just naturally, they tend to to give off these shadows that lengthen them or, you know, create mm -hmm. different moods. Because so they look quite, they, they look very ethereal. You know, there's an element of them that, that are looking uh, um, unworldly, you know, or out of this world. Right. So that quality, I think, is something that you've got, you've managed to capture. You know, they, they're, they are organic, they are ethereal, and they're actually quite powerful as well. So, um, and I'm just thinking that the times that we are finding ourselves in, that mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a term, I think, um, Mark used at the beginning about, you know, if you look in water or clouds or the sky, you can see all of these, you know, with a, with a heightened sense of imagination, you can see these, these figures or, you, you know, and, and there's actually a word, I forget the word that Mark used, I think it began with P, but um, it's, it's this idea of saying things um, that are almost like unworthy in, in, in the ordinary, saying the Seeing the extraordinary and the ordinary, and that's what strikes me. What you've what you've done and what you've seen and what you've created, you know. I appreciate I appreciate that. One of the things that I that I want to do is, I almost want to make pieces to where if you saw them in nature, you wouldn't think twice about them being there. Yes. So, but but then when you see them again, it's like okay, well that can't be what I'm thinking that it is. Yeah. Because that doesn't grow like that. Yes. And, uh, yeah. And I'm starting to go. Um, I'm starting to, to get away from the, um, the figurative form a little bit. I guess I'm dividing up my time. You know, I've got some that are, that are less, that have less of a human quality and they're becoming more of these plants, these organic things that I don't think they're going to be as, as striking as the human ones because it's overtly, there's a, there's a, you know, a, a different dichotomy with the two, but yes. I think they're going to be subtle. And, um, this one, I think this one is, was the start of it. Uh, And this one's also in, in the um, in the gallery as well. Gallery. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. And it doesn't have any human characteristics. It's it's more of a it's more organic, more of a plant. Um, yes. Maybe even you know it kind of denotes. There's, there's there's almost uh, like a Salvador Dali quality and um, I can almost imagine a garden where these things are growing, you know, that these look as if they're actually growing out of the ground. Okay, I think I have you back. Yeah, yeah. They, they, there's almost like, um, a, 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 you know, that, that kind of uh, Salvador Dali quality that they're like organic, that they're growing out of the, out of the ground. You know, there's a, is there a piece that the Garden of Earthly Delights that, mm -hmm. That's in the Salvador Dali piece. And I, I can almost imagine um, there, there was a, a sculptor, a, a, a gallery in, in um, Belfast 
and what they did was they brought a series of sculptures by well-known artists and they put them in, in, the, in the, the gardens around this hotel. And I think, uh, Susan, I might have sent you some images of those. And yeah. um, but some of them looked as if they belonged there, as if they grew out of the ground. And what I see in what you have created, they're almost or organic, that they look as if they could be growing. They literally could mm -hmm. be just popping up. And, um, and I also can see the potential of them. I know some of them, have, you've been hanging them, you know, so the mm -hmm. idea of reflections and shadows. But also, um, there's another artist, um, I've shown you some of her work as well, uh, Helen, or um, Susan called Helen Merrigan Coffer. Right. And she works with natural forms as well. She works with resin. And wow. she also works with um, armatures that she creates. Some are figurative, some are, are, are very much organic. Some are very um, uh, abstract pieces as well, Nathan, and, and I can send the link as well to yourself and, and to Susan. And uh, they're very much part of that. And she's very much into, you know, nature and the environment. And then other pieces are very much um, utilitarian in what she's created, you know, as mm -hmm. well. But I, I can see, I mean, I also, I also can see, she, she does them, her pieces are about that, this size, you know, dimensions. And mm -hmm. then what she's done, she's scaled some of them up and, and created bronzes, which is a very expensive, you know, process, obviously. But I can see the, bulb, the bulbous nature of what you've created are, they're, they're very powerful that you can imagine them being created in a whole range of, you know, strong, solid, um, heavy sculptures that are, um, Untoppable that you can't, you know, you can't knock them over. They're, that they're really stable, and no matter what you try and do, that they will remain almost connected to the ground. You know. Moving to, to bronzes, you know, there's the um, we've got a, a foundry here called the Crucible, and uh, a good friend of mine. Well, Paul, he's a, a artist also. That's uh, that Susan represents a good friend of mine, yeah. my mentor. And we went yes, down Paul, to the Paul, 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 Paul Medina. Who, Medina. Yes. Paul uh, Medina. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, if I had a second dad, that would be him. We're, I we're can extremely, see why. We're extremely close. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, he, um, we went down to the foundry, um, uh, the Crucible, and uh, that's when we were talking about, you know, the, the next evolution of maybe what I could do. And um, because I work in two styles, you know, we were talking about, you know, would it be easier to do uh, the organic sculptures or would it be to my advantage to start with some of the, um, the, uh, the larger, I and I haven't shown them to you, you know, I, I work in three or four different mediums. I'm going to show that I guess that's a good segue into this, yes. into some of my more figurative work. Um, and uh, Randy Marks uh, with the, um, um, that was talking about the public art. They have a public art program here. And, you know, that's another thing that, that this virus has done. It's made me consider all these avenues that were presented to me that I didn't take yes. advantage of. And yes. there's all these public art projects. And this is the work that Randy is partial to that I'm about to show you. And okay. it's a bit more figurative. Um, and I'm really influenced by um, some of the uh, uh, old world art as well. You know, and this, um, it's not bronze, but it gives you the impression of it being bronze. Yes, yes. It looks almost like soapstone. Yep. I had gone to Italy and I saw this, this green patina. It was, um, I forgot the name of that fountain. Uh, everybody's throwing pennies in. And, yes, yes. Uh -huh. And it's, it's the wings, I, you know, I, I kind of um, made the patina like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. So this would be much heavier. What, 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 what materials have you used for this? For this, is, this is ceramic. Yes. Uh -huh. So that's in clay. That's created in clay. And is that, is that fired? Is that fired and glazed? Or is it a... Is it a how have you... How have you um, is um, it burnished is, or is it... This is uh, that stain that I was telling you about that I, I don't know the name of it. It's got so many uses that I incorporate it all kinds of ways. If I mix it with some of the, um, um, it doesn't even have to be the, 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 the same brown color. It makes, a, it makes a richness to it. 
And uh, uh-huh. an artist from, Tunda Darve, who's another artist, she's, she's incredible. She's from Transylvania. I did not know Transylvania was even a real place. I thought it was just in Dracula novels. Yeah. She, yeah. she goes to Greece to get this thing. And every time yeah. she goes there, she brings it back. And I found so many different uses for it. So have you, have you, um, you have fired this, first of all, in a kiln? Yes. And then, and then you've applied the surface over the top of it? I put the stain on, I put the stain on, and what happens is the, the clay, it's still porous, you know, it's still, you know, a surface that absorbs stuff. It absorbs the stain in it, and I do this over and over and over, and when I get that color that I'm wanting, I seal it. And it continues to absorb, and a little bit of the color. You were saying it continues to absorb then the, 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 the color? Yes. Uh-huh. It keeps absorbing the colors um, because if you put one coat in, it'll absorb it and it'll just be on the other side on the inside because it's hollow. It'll just keep absorbing all the way through. Yes. But I, I saturate it. So it's a series of, of glazes that are over it. Uh, it's, not a, it's not like anything, um, a, a glaze where you fire it. They're all hand painted. Right. So, so the, the original ceramic piece is um, biscuit fired and then... The, the color is hand painted and not fired. Not fired. That yeah. stain, I, I paint that stain on first and that stain is absorbed and absorbed and absorbed. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you two, two artists work um, and it gives you sort of an idea. Um, hopefully you'll hear me. Um, my background's in painting and ceramics, but this is an artist um, who's from Ireland. And you can see Nice. And that's biscuit fired. Uh, it's white clay, but he put some oxides into it just to get the, you know, the, the burnish effect. Yes. Okay. Like and then this, this is another artist who is, um, who's now working in bronze. And he is, um, you can see his pieces. That's impressive. Yeah. Now, this was one of his earlier pieces, uh, Nathan, and his name, his name is Anthony Scott, and he does, um, he does life-size pieces now, and he's, he's well known. I'll send you some details about him. And he, these are my pieces now. These are from years ago. These ones up here, the ceramics. They're, they're just using glazes and, and oxides, but, um, but Anthony Scott is, a, is a, an Irish artist and he started a lot of hand-built uh, figurative pieces, mostly, mostly animals and warriors, and a lot of it is based on Celtic mythology. And then he, what he has done, he's stylized the um, animals and he's used a series of oxides on biscuit, you know, yeah. biscuit-fired um, uh, clay. And then what he's done as well is that he's moved across into um, bronzes, you know, and he's do, he does life-size horse, horses and all sorts of things. But he, he um, and, and they've become very, very, very expensive. Now, that piece that I showed you of the man on the horse was a very, um, a very early piece that he did. And it was just an experiment, an experimentation where he used just biscuit firing and then oxides and not glazes. Whereas wow. now he's kind of com- combining most, both, but mostly now working in bronze. So, um, and then the first one I showed you, the man and woman on the horse, he's mm-hmm. a, an artist as well and a painter called Christy Keeney. And his work tends to be mostly slab built. We make, you know, slabs of clay and then they're almost like um, slithers of clay to make up the figures, you know, yeah. so they're, they're almost low relief as opposed to, you know, completely in the round. And um, then this is a, a, a poster of one of the pieces he, he makes. That, that can give you an idea of, um, see the, the, so it's like two slabs of clay that with a head drawn, you know, and then put together back in front, but very, mm-hmm. very low relief. You know, it's not in the round the way that your figures would be. What, what I'll do as well, um, Nathan, there is, I, I mentioned before, there is um, 
an annual exhibition every year that's held in, in Northern Ireland called the Royal Ulster Academy. And it's mm -hmm. made up of artists from a whole range of art disciplines, painters, sculptors, and some are really, really well known and some are emerging artists. And uh, so there's some people that I think will be really worth your while looking to see, you know, just to see what they, you know, what they, what they do and, and the techniques that they use as well. But, um, but the two people that I think that you would enjoy looking at and maybe communicating with is Helen Morgan Coffer, who's the lady okay. I mentioned to you before. And um, a, she's doing a series at the minute called Redaction, Redacted, this idea about, you know, we all wear masks, even before the whole uh, pandemic, you know, that this idea of identity and um, uh, dignity and self-expression. So she's making all these little tiny little characters but the organic ones that she's made, I'll, I'll send you through, uh, just you can look at her website and, and even okay. make contact with her directly. Um, she and her husband are in lockdown, obviously, like many at the minute, and she's looking after her, her mother-in-law. So um, she, like many, uh, aren't particularly motivated to make work at the minute. I mean, I, I, I am not particularly um, feeling creative at the minute because I'm feeling, I'm feeling kind of a lot of the... Um, I suppose with, with people that have that have died and, and family members that I'm concerned about and you know all of that, I just find my head's just full of stuff. And I'm even I'm even finding that I didn't know how to do Zoom until a few weeks ago. <laughs> and Susan and I have been in contact every week since May of last year. That I'm actually exhausted. I don't know whether you feel like Susan, but I feel oh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. My energy levels are are low. Um, it's a beautiful day outside here in in, in Ireland, but um, I have I've spent today just sending emails and trying to connect with this friend's family, and I have one of these books, you know, um, to write down all my ideas and all the rest. And I'm, I'm I'm writing a wee note on each of the artists that I'm talking to yourself, included Nathan. Um, and I think out of all of the artists that I've met so far, I, I, I recognise your work from the very very beginning, you know, because it is so different. It's very, very unique, and I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. And um, but so I can see, you know, the um, the the. I suppose we're all, I suppose, looking at ways in which we can make and create work. But there are lots of art artists who obviously are in lockdown and enjoying the fact that they don't have to perform for anybody else. They're just enjoying making. There's mm -hmm. some that are completely intimidated by it and feel that they should be producing because there are other artists who. Are, who are constantly posting stuff up that I did this today, I did this today. And I, I, that, that cracks me up because I, I don't feel particularly productive. And I think it was Danny Rose we talked before as well, as Susan last week, and he was saying that he didn't feel particularly productive either. And I think that's okay. I think, I think if you're writing, if you're researching, uh, you know, what you were talking about before, Nathan, um, finding out even how the system works, finding out about other artists, other opportunities, actually sometimes standing still we can move forward at a greater pace by just standing still i agree it's it's um um who was that there was a friend of mine that said you know there's being busy and then there's looking busy and yes. he was like yeah I'd, I'd rather be you know i'd rather be busy and if, if busy is just you know meditating and getting your mind right for what you're about to create Yes. Um, or just just detoxing spiritually so that you have room to do stuff you're you're working towards creating you're working towards doing something absolutely yeah. I, you, th that the whole thing of detoxing and whether it's going to do something random like i call it the hot press technique that if i, I if i feel that i don't know where to start i go and do something one day and like tidy up a hot press mm -hmm. and and in the unraveling process and that state of flow that's where something will come through that's where i get my um my sense of um, connection, you know, and the only one thing that I know I do every day, apart from eat, is uh, <laughs> is light a candle, you know, and that kind of ritual. I do, you know, I write down ideas and, and feelings and all that. But just what you said there about kind of that meditative um, uh, detoxing kind of scenario, where you kind of spew out if you like in whatever way it comes you know yeah. if it's onto a piece of paper and one of the things I did a, I did a, a journaling course up years ago and one of the things that they advised every morning is um, just just to get up in the morning 
and write for just write two pages of absolute yep. it could be dribble but get it out of your head and clear the space and and then just get on with what you want to do and i know it's really important to have some sort of structure some sort of um focus for the day but some days actually just to be is is enough you know mm -hmm. sometimes i write i mean i write what yeah. i would like to do yes you know? well that's really important because i all of my all of my paintings all of my ideas start off with you know writing and if i'm working on an, a, a, a title for an exhibition you know i'm i'm looking at you know kind of little spider diagrams yeah. and um, it's, it's the feelings it's the motions um and then none of it's a waste of time you know it could be a piece of poetry it could be a song it could be just a mood you know and i've got think, mine right here <laughs> yeah and i think i think if you are anyway an empath if you if you're anyway um a person who's connected to other people's feelings or emotions you feel that vibration very 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 um and sometimes it's very very painfully but um i think it's important to protect ourselves as well you know and you'd said as well susan at the beginning when we were talking on the sunday night about you know before we even did the studio visits about we just have to you know sometimes just be, be um gentle with ourselves you know yeah. And um, like I, I'm, I'm used to being busy. I'm used to, you know, doing loads of things and getting, you know, so, supporting lots of people do different things. And for me to retreat, which I like to do, and just be quiet is a real gift. But there's a phrase as well, you know, becoming a busy fool. You know that yeah. that you were talking there about being busy. That um, you can be a busy fool and be at your least productive. Mm -hmm. And being productive is not about what you make or what you do it's the quality of what you what you do you know it's it's um and 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 the rest and the sleep and the the retreat is all all part of it all part of it because we'll never we'll, we'll never get this way we'll never get this time back no we don't we Nathan, don't so can you I hear think, me i think yeah i think it might be nice for you to share a little bit about your book and the illustrations oh you know i i, I forgot yeah because um, you <laughs> Nathan is a writer and he also does film, but he's, uh -huh. just, he's just done a book. Lovely. And, and the book, um, it, it actually deals with um, a, lot of, a lot of things that are, they're social, but you know, sometimes you have to poke fun at yourself. There's some things that we know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, have to, you have to laugh. If you don't laugh, even if it's a serious thing, you know, I deal with, um, Everything from um, gender roles, uh, identity, uh, to uh, male suicide, uh, and, yeah. and just ideas of masculinity. It, it's such a, you know, there's there's so many things that are turned toxic that were at one time attributes that we all loved. You know, there was there was there was value in in men and women, and um, nowadays it's all a political platform for everybody to, yeah. to just be seen. So I, um, I wrote this 40 page, it's basically a storybook for, um, for adults. And it's, um, it's called The Frozen Tundra. And I took these, these 20 drawings and I made, um, I made stories behind them. And I'll, I don't know how well they, you can see them or Can you see? A wee, bit a wee bit closer. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. And um, this one, I mean, and it's it's you know all of it's kind of tongue in cheek. It's the name of it is why is my kid so goddamn stupid? But if you yeah. look at if you look at the kid, he's simply a reflection of his father. Yeah. So his dad's got these these thoughts and ideas, you know, and and not wanting this kid to disappoint him. But he hadn't really stopped to think about how he's he's disappointing his own child, like how he's making the model for his kid yeah. to have. He's the template. He's the yeah. template for the disappointment that he has in his kid. And there's there's no accountability. He's not even being introspective. So he's he's one of those parents that just kind of kind of ask the questions that if he if he would look in the mirror, it's right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 
they're 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 beautiful shapes, uh, Nathan. It'll it'll one second. They're beautiful shapes. They're 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 quite fun and the shape the shapes that you've got. Yeah, they're um they I don't know, you know, a lot of people, you know, ask me, okay, well why are they all chubby? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, it started when, when my daughter was born. You know, she was a chubby baby. So I yeah. don't know. You know. There may have been some kind of, um, there may have been something with that. Uh -huh. and, and this, you know, anyway, the book, it, it, it pokes fun. I mean, even, you know, this one right here, it's, you are a fat man in a dress. There, there, um, there is a, a two artists that I'm thinking of, and I'll send you the information. One is a lady called Beryl Cook who's really well known for that, those type of figures. Mm -hmm. And there's another lady who I would have worked with, and she's an artist from Donegal, and she creates books yep. um, that are almost like modern day parables. Mm -hmm. And the figures are very, very personal to her. And I, I drove to meet her uh, once and, and visited her studio, and I was so impressed, because my, my face is just it's very, um, I'm not a particularly tidy artist, and, I, and I, my work is kind of, um, uh, you know, I, I stop and start. You know, I don't have a particularly have a, have a space here. Um, uh, Nathan. That's the <laughs> best. That's the different. best way to work. The best way to work is when you know you can be reckless and you can just you can throw yourself into it. Them, that's, what it's, that's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> and this is this is the garage, right? That I'm that has been tidied now. I have a fair bit to do, right? So it gives you an idea of um, of how untidy this place is, right? So this well, is me good. trying to this is me trying to organise myself. But <laughs> um, the pieces that 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 I'm interested in working on at the minute are these kind of things. I might have shown you these before. Um, you know, this idea of um, colour and figures. And nice. Stuff, you know, so the whole idea of the textures and the and the, the absences in life, you know, the losses and the gains, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I'm, I, I, and I'm working on this piece here, and I couldn't be bothered at the minute. I'm just, I, I'm more interested in poetry and, um, and just wee pieces like this. So I'm really, really interested in color, you know. And these are other wee pieces, you know. Um, but I just, I, I find them at the minute I'm painting over things, you know. I'm just. I'm just, um, and I'll come back to them. I'll come yeah. back to them. It's just that with the way things are at the minute, um, I'm just, I'm preoccupied with um, the, the people that haven't been well and people that are that we're losing at the minute, you know. So, um, but uh, and then the pieces that I did do, these are these are more figurative from these are like from years ago, you know, these pieces, mm -hmm. um, and. This piece here from years ago. I like your command of color. There's a, an artist that, that I love named Sandro Kia because of the, his usage of colors. It puts yes. me in the mind of, of Sandro, Sandro Kia. I, I love his work. Yes. Well, you see, the color is very important. I, I love color. I love texture. And I love scale. And then what I did was I was working from my, on large scale pieces, then until very, very small pieces. And then, mm -hmm. then I'm kind of... Um, mixing and matching at the minute as well, but at the minute, oh, the, then I did a whole series. These now again, this was like standing still and looking forward. This piece here, I don't know whether you can see the back of the the lady there. Nice. Bring it a little bit closer, Noel, so we can see yep. it. And say something so we can see it larger. So this is this is like the back view. So the idea is that you're standing behind her, and it's called standing still and looking mm -hmm. forward. So it's, a, it's an oil, you know, it's an oil piece. And then these were pieces that I did because my background's painting and ceramics. These are just little um, working with scrap materials and paint and shellac as well, you know, and just this idea about things that are disposed of or precious, you know. Turning small things into something significant. I love, I love yeah. that. It's making the ordinary extraordinary, you know, this idea that mm -hmm. we're all disposable, but there's something precious, you know, in all of us and um, kind of playing on that. But I mean, my ideas could start off like that there, you know, just, you yes. know, random notes and 
poetry and um, quotes and things like that, you know. And uh, so I usually start off with a title for an exhibition. And usually if I, I visualize the space I'm going to have the exhibition in and I visualize the scale of the works that I want to work on. And the last solo exhibition that I had was, um, was on a barge and the pieces were all quite small, you know. Um, and it was called Precious Cargo. And then I was over in a place called um, the University of Transylvania in Lexington, Kentucky, which I didn't think actually existed. But I was over doing pieces there. Um, after, this was years ago. And, um, and then I was also involved, it was sent to Susan, um, a piece, these you know, little exhibitions that have, um, the artists are invited to respond to a, a, a piece of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, then the the scale of the work is um, one foot square, pretty much, um, on the frame pieces. And then, I mean, this one was was one that I did earlier in the year. Um, you can see it. Nice. You know, and it's there's almost like a figurative quality to it. And it, it's called Powers and Empires Pass Away radiant and unconquerable and it could be actually relevant now um, but you have so many different artists responding to the um, theme you mm -hmm. know but it's a lovely idea you know and it's a very good scale to work on you know and, and actually from from the um, gallery's perspective as well Susan mm -hmm. it's something and what 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 this gallery does um, they invite artists to respond to the piece of poetry. And then the work is, is collected, it's, it's not framed. It's all exhibited together, you know, right, you know, it's like there's no space in between. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. they're all right up together. And, um, and then it's brought then over to, it, it's, it's, it's gone from Sligo, which is in the south of Ireland, over to London and then over to um, uh, New York as well, you know, to the, um, the Irish Embassy. So this idea of international connections that are connected by theatre or um, poetry or, you know, cultural connections, it's something that I think works well. But, you know, this idea of something that is easily to easy to transport and easy to set up, you know, um, because you know as well that if work is heavy or bulky or large, the packaging and the costs of transporting it and also the likelihood of damage as well, you know, too, is something that you have to consider as well, both as an artist and as a, as a gallery too, Susan. So there's lots there. There's a lot there. Um, but um, it seems to me, Nathan, you've, you've, you, you know, you know the way people say you're onto something. You've got, you've got your own unique style. You're, you seem to be very, very capable in your use of materials. And, and again, it's, there's the joy and the, the pain and, and, and finding out new things. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the freeing ourselves up to be experimental is very, very important. You know, and and I think if we want to keep our work fresh, and and um and not get stale, we have to you know we have to be experimental. But I suppose the other thing is that um and I don't know whether you feel this. Sometimes we are paralysed by fear, you know, in that there is this expectation that oh my goodness that oh that every day you have to create a masterpiece and suddenly if you're exposing yourself and your work to uh uh, uh you know to the public well, then expectations grow, you know. And, and then if you're exposing yourself to a virtual platform like this, you know, in, in terms of with other artists, then there's that healthy competition on one hand, but then there's that complete self-deprecation on the other because we do compete, we do compare, and, and that's, that can be really, really labour-intensive, but really quite, de quite destructive. You know, I, I think what helped me is having a mentor, you know, because, you know, having yes. Paul and uh, my friend Skip, there's a competitiveness with us, but yes. it's never it's never a stylish competitiveness. What it is yes. is a quality competitiveness. Yes. And, yes. Um, you know, and that's the, good. That's good because I encourage you to raise your game, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to, um, and I suppose there, there's, there's uh, uh, my role would have been, uh, you know, as a teacher as well, that you're trying to draw out the best all of the time. You're trying to encourage rather mm -hmm. than crush somebody's confidence. And you're looking yeah. for the best in them rather than to destruct. Yeah. You know. Everything is not always a masterpiece. I mean, I had to, I had to learn that. And some pieces are going to do what they're going to do. And most of, of, of my work, it leads me somewhere. And I just have to go with it. 
So yeah. if I if I just don't like where it's going, rest assured, I get to go on another journey as soon as this piece is complete. Yeah. But yeah. it absolutely will not let me go where it doesn't uh -huh. want me to go. And yes. I quit fighting it. You know, there's so many yeah. pieces that I threw away because I wanted something else to happen instead of just letting it, you know, organically become what it is. And that that was something that I had to come to terms with is let it be what it is. Um, everybody will always like something different about your art. You know, some people like this, you know, that, you know, this aspect of your work and some people like that aspect of your work, but let the work live before you just destroy it. You know? Absolutely. And I mean, there's a teacher in me as well that would, you know, particularly when you're encouraging uh, uh, students for their exams, don't throw anything away because it could be the gem of something that is really quite profound, you know, and even if it's a case of, you know, you, you turn it that way or that way or that way, you know what I mean? That sometimes you, something that you think you're, you can struggle with and over, in my case, overpaint it and think, no, this isn't going to work. And then you look at it in a different light at a different time when you've actually relaxed into a flow. That's when something magical happens. That's yeah. when, you know, but you could lose it equally as, as quickly as you find it, you know, um, no Nathan, doubt. Nathan, I wanted to, to say that in addition to these individual contexts that Noelle will be giving you about the artists that she has been thinking about, we've also been thinking about, we were kind of planning if she was going to be physically here, but now that we're doing this virtual communication, um, that we might be able to do some type of exhibition, a virtual exhibition that could be on art scene now because we can develop these exhibitions with Irish artists, Oklahoma artists, and you know, we're not sure what that might look like, but we've just begun talking about about that. So that would be fun to kind of keep in mind too, something that, you know, just a, a totally new exhibition across the Atlantic, but it's mm -hmm. happening really across the virtual airwaves. It's funny too, because there, there's, uh, this isn't a new thing, because there's, there's quite a number of artists who are creating work in lockdown. Um, some, some artists are actually showing work they've already created. Some artists are actually challenged by the work that they're doing or not doing and doing stuff. And um, there's an artist called Rita Duffy, who's a, a, an artist from Belfast who's working on this idea of the masks and about, you know, um, women and, and, you know, she's quite a political artist in terms of what she would have done, you know, and, and is quite proud of that. So there's, it's interesting to see how people are, are responding to the idea of, of isolation. And yet many artists are so used to being isolated. You know, it's, it's a, a state that they're used to being in, you know. I'm one of those artists. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the isolation hasn't been that bad for me. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's business as you usual. Mentioned, you mentioned that you were, you, quite, you were quite enjoying it, and I think there's lots of others that are quite enjoying the space to think and breathe, you know. Mm -hmm. Noelle, you had also mentioned the Royal Ulster Academy and the invitation that isn't just for Irish artists, but for artists around the world to apply to be part of that yes. virtual exhibition. Yes. Yes, normally the, the, we would have up to 1,800 entries. This is an exhibition that we have in, in Northern Ireland. And we, there, there, there is an exclusive group of artists called the Royal Ulster Academicians, um, Nathan. And so then there's an open call for anyone who wishes emerging or whatever to submit work, which then is selected by competition. And then so the work is, um, is exhibited alongside these really well-known artists. And it's on from October right through to January. Now this year, it's highly unlikely the exhibition will take place in its normal format. Mm -hmm. And what may happen, it will, will be that it will be an online exhibition. So, you know, I can keep you posted about that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a couple of links. The links to the Royal Ulster Academy, the links to the artist Roisin Duffy, who does the book, you know, with these uh, animated characters when you talked about your book. The other... Um, uh, artist Helen Merrigan Coffer, who's the sculptor, and also Christy Keeney, who's a ceramic artist who does the, the, the man and woman on the horse that I showed you, and another guy, Anthony Scott. And it'd just be interesting for you to kind of look and see, you know, from your own perspective. You know, you have your own path that you've furrowed, you have your own ideas, your own sense of style. And I mean, you've got a great mentor in Paul and, and the support there from, from Susan as well. 
you know, and it's, it seems to me that you have, you have created something very, very unique and that you're on your own journey. And, you know, it's not that we, we it's nice to be, to look at other people's practice and to share ideas and suggestions and all of that. But, but the reality is, you know, it's, it's good to be comfortable in your own skin, you know, mm-hmm. and, but, but, but being informed by others is, is it can be inter- interesting as well, you know, and um, with that, it's, you know. Noel? Screen froze on me yeah, over here. It, it froze, yeah. I don't know that we'll get her back. I'm not sure. And now you're nice and clear, so. Who knows? You have to forgive me for my terrible internet that I that I pay way too much for. <laughs> well, do you know, it happens to me here, and I have to be on one side of the house in order to not lose my internet. I'm and, still trying to find where, where I can be. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Hope we get her back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me, I'm going to send her a text real quick. Okay. Now she may not know she's frozen. She's very enthusiastic about about art too, and that enthusiasm uh-huh. is um, yeah. Yeah. Now let me just see if she can come back on. Okay. Yeah, I think we lost her completely. Now, she's had some difficulty, too, um, with her internet. Um, let's just give it a second. I'll see if she's going to try to come back in. There she is. There she is. Hello? No, Hello. The, phone, the phone just crashed there. Um, uh, I don't know. We have your audio. We don't have your video. Okay. Do you, okay. I'll just put that on now. Um. Yeah. There you are. Here you are. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, because I was using my phone, and then the phone died, so I lost you. So now then, um, I'm having problems with this uh, um, computer, the internet. So it's it's um it's a it's a challenge, but uh, what was I going to say to you there? Um, no, it, it's 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 good it's good to, to see what other people are doing, and that's that's a healthy thing, you know. I hope it becomes a new way that we communicate. You know, there's so many artists that I've emailed and that you talk to on Facebook that are from other countries, but this is making the world so much. And the, and the virus, I hate what it's done but it's also brought out a level of resourcefulness that we sit right absolutely. there. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody was saying that, that if there were things that you could talk, people were talking about going back to normal and some people were saying, well, we don't want to go back to normal because normal wasn't working. And if you did capture all the good stuff, you know, the fact that people are making genuine contact, yeah. the fact that people are expressing a sense of care and support and respect, and ironically, that the professions that were considered the low skill professions are the professions that we need to survive. And that, that's bringing up kind of a, 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 a sense of respect that's very, very, very necessary. There's an artist as well um, who's called Barry Turpin. He's a good friend. And this piece of work behind me is his, a piece that he did. Um, and it's, it's a painting, but it's, a, it's, a, just on, it's a, a print on canvas. I don't know whether you can see it. Um, yeah, it's start, but it's just, it's just and you can work with the cross and the cross. It's just a it's a print. But he's a great, great friend, and we would have worked together. And he has um, he has a condition where he, he has a, a major problems with his back, and um, so he can't really sleep at night. So he's up painting during the night. But he did those fantastic the most fantastic portraits. I, I shared them on Facebook, uh, Susan. Of um, you know, of the the um, the workers, the cleaners, the porters, the the nurses after they came off their shift wearing masks, 
on their faces. They were nearly like Christ-like. They were so spiritual in terms of what they, you know, what what is created. And I suggest to him that he should consider um, an, an exhibition of of them, like almost like stations, you know, stations in life. And uh, he told me that the last one that he painted, he just broke down. He was just crying when he was painting it. And um, and then he, 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 you know, I was talking to him then afterwards, and just about sometimes the emotion that that sometimes artists put into the work that they create, and also the emotions that they feel for others in terms of you know the good, the bad, or the the ugly, you know. So um, I think this period in time will go down in history for a whole lot of different reasons, and I think that there's there is a lot of good that's coming out of these these times. I think people are feeling be closer and, and connected in a, in a much more you know um, authentic way um, and yet there are other cases that are so sad I, I, there's there's a close friend as well going through a very challenging time at the minute and um, you know you, you can't help but think that there are others who are in highs and others that are in lows and earlier on this morning you were talking there um, Nathan about laughing you know and you need you need humor and wit and laughter and tears to get through these and um, I'm the eldest of seven children, adults, and two of whom we've lost to suicide. One, a sister, um, 21 years ago, and another sister three years ago. So it's been very, very tough. But the youngest, we have two sets of twins in our family, and the youngest twins would be 49, or we're 49 today. So myself and my other sister were doing um, our version of singing Happy Birthday in our kitchens, in our, you know, in our pajamas, like, you know, her standing, you know, and all the rest. And you just have to celebrate the good. You really do. And like, I was looking at what, uh, I have no, mu I love music, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't play anything. And um, I got these. Uh, I was you know, anything at all that I could, just because we're, we're all so far apart and yet we want to celebrate the good thing that we have and the connection that we have. And, um, and this is the irony, like we, 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 I come from a very close family, very self-expressed, very, you know, supportive, you know, and we're all vulnerable. We're all vulnerable and, um, and that's the sad thing. There are people trying so hard to put on a brave face and trying so hard to, to wear a mask every day of their lives. And um, isn't it ironic that we find ourselves in these, these positions now that, you know, um, we have to wear these masks and, and nobody knows, you know, what's ahead. Um, I want to thank you, Noel, for your time and Nathan for connecting with Noel. And I'm sure that Noel would be open to more conversation, Nathan, you know, over time as well.